We are live. Welcome to Review and Thoughts on 2011's Martha Marcy Mar May Marlene film. So, I absolutely love this movie. There will be few, just only a few jokes in this, and this video will get very serious. And this is one of those movies, you should probably go into it knowing nothing. If you want to know just some, or if you already watched it, watch on. I am not going to be spoiling the movie until I get, you know, in, in the review itself, I will not be spoiling the movie. I will go into spoilers after that when I get into the thoughts sections. So, the, yeah, trigger warning and or content warning, the movie features some of the following, and I'm going to talk about some of the following when I, as I talk about the movie, torture, ableism, gaslighting, domestic abuse, drugs, xenophobia, murder, suicide, sexual assault and rape, grief, bullying and other abuse, and mental illness. So the yeah, the movie is rated R, so is this video. I will be talking about some of the things that made it R rated. And yeah, the MPA rated it R for disturbing violent and sexual content, nudity and language. Now, whether you like me love this movie or if you absolutely hate it, you know, that's fine. I don't hate you for your opinion. If you express a viewpoint that goes against what I say in this video, you know, the only thing I ask is that you keep it respectful and I'll answer respectfully. If you write something hateful, whether it's directed towards me or anyone else, I'm most likely just going to ignore you. So, the... let's see... that brings us to... Um, yeah, so, this is my third watching, viewing of this movie. I first watched it uh, the 23rd of September last year, so 2021, and it's never really left my mind since. I showed it to my dad just a few days later, since he also thinks there should be more movies about cults and... I was originally going to do this sooner, but I ended up moving it down on the, the schedule. And I actually, the I only decided that I was going to do this today, like last night. So, yeah, this is set in 2011. And it is, yeah, set in Connecticut and, you know, New, New York. After two years of not hearing from her, Lucy suddenly gets a tearful call from her sister, Martha. She picks her up and drives her back to her summer home, and gradually it becomes clear that something horrible has happened in those two years. And... Let's see... That brings us to... Let's see. Yeah, so the the title, I'm going to quote a few fellow reviewers here. The film title buried it. It should have just been called Marcy May. I, I see what they mean. And I did myself stumble over saying it at the start of this video. But I, I especially agree with this reviewer. As its title suggests... Martha Marcy May Marlene is a story of fractured identity. And yeah, honestly, the, the original reason that I even watched this was that I heard that it was it, it dealt with cults and trauma. And I wanted to see more of Elizabeth Olsen. You know, I 
I probably heard about this movie back in 2011, but my main introduction to her was in 2015, The Age of Ult Avengers The Age of Ultron. And yeah, I think she's amazing in the MCU, so I wanted to see if she was amazing elsewhere, and she is. And yeah, you know, at first I wasn't even thinking in terms of um, reviewing this, of doing a video on it, but I just, it, it's such a, it really speaks to me, this movie. And let's see, there was one other, right, right. The first time I watched this was when I saw that it was on Disney+. Plus. Before that, I, you know, yeah. And it it was something where I you know I was like I rec I feel like I recognize that title so I did a little research found out it was about cults and yeah here we are and I've seen various you know yeah I've seen others compare this movie to Winter's Bone and there definitely are many similarities. This movie speaks to me in a way that that one doesn't. I watched that one when it was pretty new, and as much as I liked it, I haven't watched it at any point in the now 11 years since, nor have I ever really thought about it very much, where this one I just couldn't get out of my head. Even though the first viewing was, you know, yeah, I, by now almost an entire year. I do love and greatly admire both of these leading actresses, Jennifer Lawrence as well as Elizabeth Olsen. And, you know, I, I respect that Jennifer Lawrence wanted to take a break. I, you know, ultimately I do, th I think she should do what, what makes her more happy. And she's given us a lot of great performances, so, you know, I, yeah. By far the one that speaks the most to me of, of her performances is Katniss Everdeen in the Hunger Games quadrilogy. And I do also think she did a really great job as Mystique. But yeah, so that brings us to the writing. This was written by Sean Durkin. And other than this, he wrote The Nest in 2020 and the short film Merry Last Scene from 2010. So yeah, only two movies in total, nine years apart, and then this short film. And the short film, the, the, um, it's featured on some DVDs of this movie, and it's well worth watching. It is a sort of prequel, but you can watch them in either order. That is, you know, yeah. And yeah, the 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 movie makes it very clear that the cult lures in young women who don't really have many other options, who feel abandoned and lost. And let's see the. Yeah, it's very, you don't realize right away how economically written the movie is. Once you watch the entire thing, you really see how everything does, like, at first, there, you know, you might think, oh, well, this scene isn't really telling us anything new, you know, or the, the, or, you know, some things seem too vague, or some, you know, yeah. By the end of it, you realize how it all goes together, and I'm obviously not going to be spoiling that at this point in the video, not until the thoughts section, but if you, if you start watching it, and you feel like there's, like, certainly in the first maybe 30 minutes of the movie, it is, you know, which is, which is, like, 
the first the first chunk of the movie it, it's a that's a really good place to hook the audience if you don't get the audience invested early on you might never be able to you know if if they completely zone out you 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 might have lost them no matter how good the movie gets you know late in the yeah and yeah the the <clears throat> Early on, you really don't get much of an much of an idea of what is going on, and the the important details appear elusive. But if you stay with it, it for sure, it's not a movie for everyone. But yeah, and in addition to that, the writing also shows a very high level of emotional intelligence like the this is a movie that actually there there is some behavior in this movie that a lot of people just say you know I, I don't want anything to do with people who behave like that and over the course of this movie you understand how people do get involved in you know behavior like that and the direction the yeah this Sean Durkin both wrote and directed this and the nest let's see right he in addition he also directed Mary Lysine but he also directed the short Doris which he did not himself write I gotta admit I I really don't know very much about the nest. I'm going to just very briefly Jude Law, Carrie Coon, Una Rowe. Oh, Tony Allen. Anyway, yeah, the the um, I I might try to watch that at at some point, but. I am almost 100% certain I'm going to double check it right now that it is not currently it is not currently on Disney Plus. So yeah, and 2020, so it's not hitting theaters around here anytime soon. And let's see. Yeah, there's a really good um if you go into Sean Durkin's IMDb biography, he has this really great quote that is very relevant for this movie. I think as a child, I was really afraid of groups that conformed. Cults were really an example of that. I'm attracted to fear. I'm attracted to movies that scare you. I knew I would just end up working in that realm. And the direction, I realized that there are some people who thought that the direction here was not... Yeah, I I respect them. I completely disagree with them. Yeah, this basically the the direction is is absolutely amazing. It's not for everyone, but if it's the kind of movie, it's, yeah, one of the best things about this movie is the flowing transition between flashback and scenes set in the present, and it is reminiscent of Christopher Nolan's approach to that and he put it to incredible use in The Prestige and that is definitely also a movie that but but yeah I'm really I guess overall I prefer this one to The Prestige and that is high praise because I love Christopher Nolan's work and I think The Prestige is probably overall his best movie that doesn't have Batman in it it's it's very very high up there certainly and let's see. yeah so in I watched some interviews with the director I've always my whole life been interested in why people believe what they believe and felt like it's often arbitrary and therefore cults are the extreme exploration of that 
I might watch it today and be like, oh, I'd shoot that differently or cut that differently. Now I have knowledge of different things filmmaking-wise, but not really. Part of what makes first features great first features is you see some imperfections and you see the growth. I love it for that. There's a purity to that. A lot of people go back and recut their movies now. I just don't really get it. The movie stands alone in that moment in time. You can't make it any different because that's who you were then. That There's a beauty to that I really embrace. And that, yeah, that interview was much more recent. I forget exactly when it was from, but yeah, that was not one of the interviews he gave close to the premiere, obviously. The, the, yeah, I, I disagree with him on that. I, I think that the movie is absolutely perfect. I, I would not want it to have been shot or cut in any other way. And I really, you know, some people really don't like that there are a number of What's the... Some people do not like that there are shots in this where there are things that are blurry. And some people even say, oh, it's that's just bad filmmaking. I would agree if not for... Like, if I just saw, like, one or two shots from this movie and I didn't know... You know, this is, this is critically acclaimed. This, it won awards. This, you know, yeah, it, it might appear to be incompetence, but I'd ask you to look at what shots are and what shots aren't blurry, and what is blurry in the shot, because that is significant. There's, yeah, and I acknowledge there are things in this that because of filming conditions, they ended up looking a certain way, but I think... I think it fits. I, I, yeah. And I, I don't excuse bad filmmaking. I, I try to call that out. This is an incredibly intelligent exploration of a cult reminiscent of the Manson family. Its methods, the long-term impact on the person purposefully traumatized. The editing is tremendously clever, weaving flashbacks into present-day scenes of normalcy smoothly and to great effect will transition from one to the other because that's how the world feels to her. They both feel like they're happening right now, and maybe they always will be. And... Yeah, and, and some people who don't know much about cults and can't really empathize they, they can't really imagine what it's like to be in a cult. Yeah, some of those people feel that the movie is too just disjointed. I, I think I even saw one person say, the movie does itself no favors by being so disjointed. I 100% disagree. And I, again, I, I tend to like movies where I can pinpoint everything. But how the, the fact that this movie is so disjointed, like... That, that really is how it is right after you've been pulled out of this extremely traumatizing situation. And and some people say, oh, you know, it's not the, the, ah, uh, what's it, what's the, ah, uh, the, the, mm. yeah, some, some people feel like two years is too little for her as an adult woman, to have completely changed her, like, the, the way she look, like, social norms are completely foreign to her now. She, she tries to keep living her life the way it was in the cult, and that is a, a big challenge for her sister Lucy and Lucy's husband Ted, and the, yeah. Two years is a lot, and if everyone around you behave in a very specific way, it's there aren't very many people who aren't going to try to behave in a in a way that then that the group approves of. And let's. See. Yeah, so I'm going to quote some critics. I realize it may not technically be a horror movie, but it is a disturbing movie that very gradually builds... Uh, let's 
fantasy to the point we might not realize that it is building. To me, it's a horror movie, and I 100%. I, I, um, I used to say that the, ah, uh, one of the scariest movies to me is the original, I haven't watched the, I know there's at least one other version, Rosemary's Baby. And I realize, you know, it's it's not super gory or bloody or such. You know, my, my favorite gory horror movie is The Thing from 1982, not the other ones. Though I respect the Howard Hawks one. I definitely respect the Howard Hawks one. I do not respect the terrible prequel remake. And no one should. I do forgive Mary Elizabeth Winstead for that. Uh, she did incredible in Birds of Prey, so I 100% forgive her for appearing in that terrible movie. This is very close for me. I Overall, it probably still is Rosemary's Baby. But this comes very, very close. And, yeah, another critical quote. When she comes back to her family, we realize that it's her family who drove her into the cult in the first place. And A long, slow build with the pressure and apprehension grows and increases steadily throughout, wrapping you in a tight, squeezing grip. What Sean Dorkin delivers here is not a cult film at all, but something more troubled and insidious, a film about a cult. And Durkin reveals how the sisters have been pulled in opposite directions by the death of the parents, but the story structure also nurtures a creeping, finally unbearable dread that may have you looking over your shoulder all the way home. I, I believe if, if I had watched this in a theater, that is definitely my reaction. And... Right, another, it's, yeah. Like Roman Polanski's repulsion, Martha Marcy May Marlene gradually places us inside the mind of a woman who just might be insane. Let's see. This time the horror follows you home. Unlike many other jumbled timeline films, the cuts here are always done meaningfully. Some event will trigger her to flashback or re-enter the present moment, and many of them are also unnoticeable. There were times during the film that I wasn't quite sure which setting we were at. You have to piece the movie together. While that doesn't necessarily reward the impatient, those who give themselves over to this kind of storytelling will almost certainly admire it. I respectfully disagree with the following, but, you know, this is how some people feel. The film's one device, cross-cutting very demonstratively between identically rhetorical moments in the commune and the lakeside house, is exceedingly literal and obvious, and this reviewer gave it a 2 out of 5. And that brings... Yeah, so, the opening of the movie is excellent. The, you know, the opening is where you want to set up, not for all movies, but it's a good place to set up the rest of the movie, and ideally the rest of the movie then pays off and, and follows that setup. And I would definitely say this, yeah, this both succeeds at the setup and payoff. At the very, very start, we see that... Martha and others live on a farm, and other than Patrick, well, get more into later, maybe one or two others, they all appear to be under 30 years old, and, you know, a number of them 20 or, or younger. We see the men eat dinner before the women, who have to wait in another room until the men are all done. They all sleep in the same room. And then we see Martha flee. 
and basically like she is determined to get away and over the course of the movie you will come to understand why that is but yeah you know she she desperately feels a need to get away and in almost no time everyone on the farm goes looking for her you know as as soon as she's as, as it's n discovered that she ran and when she in tears and scared calls her sister she doesn't think that she can stay until the sister gets there she's she's literally verbatim says i can't wait that long and you know that's the kind of thing, like i i get why for some people that will be frustratingly vague but for me i just like i i still i still remember the exact like i i didn't realize that the movie was going to start with her fleeing you know i one of the few things i knew for sure was it's about her life with this cult so you know it's like it seemed to me like counterintuitive why how can it be about the life on the farm if like the the first yeah the first thing we see is her leave that life and what i came to realize is it's not about whether she's in danger whether whether or not whether or not she was in danger in the in the farm flashbacks it's not about whether or not the uh, mortal danger i mean it's not about whether or not she'll live through it it's about what the cult did to her and how purposeful and organized almost mechanical it was and and that's something you really you you only fully realize over the course of watching there isn't really like there there are standout scenes but it's not there there isn't like any one scene that just completely solidifies that all of the you know that the the cult is a bad thing you know and and it's not a spoiler to say as you know like i said it literally starts with her fleeing them and then they go like searching for, like right off the bat two big red flags you know we don't know yet what they've done that scared her like that you know i mean, I mean let's let's say like if you're just living in the same place as other people you don't you don't have to flee you know you can just tell them i you know i'm i'm moving out i you know i'll miss you guys but i'm i'm moving out but she like she sneaks off you know as she she wakes up early and sneaks off hoping that no one else is awake yet and then they go chasing after her like that is not normal the the yeah so so the right off the bat you can tell that there's something very wrong but you don't know a lot of the details as yeah now i am not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad but it fits with what came before and you know a lot of people hate the ending but to me the ending is perfect and you know yeah i already i already mentioned you know it's it's the kind of thing that really stays the the movie stays with you for a long time this is one of my all time favorite endings i i when i hit record it was very shortly after i watched the ending for a third time knowing cuz i watched it twice before knowing exactly what the ending is and it is still just this this gripping just like yeah i i it's it's absolutely perfect to me and let's see yeah so yeah i'm i'm going to i disagree with the following critic quote but some people will feel this way about it. The ending will be loved by many, loathed by an equal amount. I feel there were better ways to conclude the story, but I understand 
I suppose. I understand why. Let's go with that. And this river did give it three out of four. And it's also the the ending the the end credits are also quite like they're they're very low key and like you know not a spoiler just, there's plenty of movies have end credits where some music plays over but it's just so haunting and just yeah and let's see the that brings us to the characters so yes Elizabeth Olsen plays the lead and I suppose I am I'm I'm going to be calling her Martha and yeah she plays every aspect of the character incredibly convincingly and yeah she gives an absolutely amazing performance even if the lead performance was bad a lot would still work about the movie but it, it, it it's it's one of the best performances I've ever seen regardless of gender age skin color anything now let's see yeah so Elizabeth Olsen's face is tremendously expressive and we can't help but empathize whether we're seeing one of her as time with the cult passes increasingly rare, warm smiles, or if her face is strained in pain, fear, anxiety, or lacking much expression in what is clearly a depression. The role never feels overplayed, there's tremendous subtlety, and the full emotion only rarely comes to the surface when she simply can't restrain herself any longer, and it won't always be a negative emotion. Sometimes she can't keep from from laughing or smiling at something where like us in the audience were like you really shouldn't laugh at that that's really not considered socially acceptable but she's been in this cult she's been away from normal normal society for so you know heavy emphasis on the air quotes there there is no normal but what I will say is the cult is a lot unhealthier for her and the others participating than the the kind of life that Ted and Lucy are used to. While I agree that Elizabeth is a better actress than the Olsen twins, it makes me uncomfortable when people gleefully announce that fact. The Olsen twins were shoved into the spotlight since they were small children. Weren't they like infants when they when they were first on the the I should know this. Um uh, Full House, that's it. I I feel like they were like, you know, the fact that they never became that good at acting is just one of those things that sometimes happens with child actors. I really don't like I get a lot of people really hate them. Don't hate the the two twins hate the people who made like you know so much of their lives just became you know products to consume for for the audience and it's 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 really gross i agree that it is there's it is i i do think that it is wrong for you know yeah since since they were very small children They've appeared in, you know, I mean, the, the sitcom is one thing. I don't, I tend to dislike child acting as a concept. I, I, I know, I get that it's weird to have, like, 18-year-olds playing child versions of them. You know, and unless, it's, yeah, I've, there are episodes of Dexter where, you know, Dexter is, the uh, Michael, uh, the guy who plays Dexter. I'm sorry I forget the name. I'm a big fan. Where he has to, you know, they, they did cast an actual teenager for those scenes, but there are scenes where he's supposed to be playing like maybe 21 or something, and it's just awkward. So I get that. 
but I don't, I, I, I am of the opinion that children should never be made to act, and we should just kind of go along with it when we see, you know, adults playing children, you know, 30-somethings playing high school students and such. I think that your childhood should be as healthy and normal as possible. Then when you come of age, you get to decide whether or not you should keep acting, you know. And certainly some of the more well-adjusted, you know, adults who grew up acting before they came of age, like Natalie Portman, Kristen Stewart, you know, various, they, yes, they did several, you know, they, they did, they appeared in movies in, in like their teen years and such, but they weren't constantly acting and they, they weren't forced to take role after role after role that really was just not particularly fulfilling or satisfying. And it matters a lot. Uh, you know, I've done a tiny bit of acting myself, and it matters a lot whether you connect, wh whether you think that the, the character you're playing is particularly interesting. And yeah, you know, I, I don't think I've watched, I'm not sure I've watched any Olsen Twin movie, but I, I did watch the, the show when I was a kid myself. I've seen reviews of some of the movies, including by Obscurus Lupa. Well, I guess, uh, is she going by her own name today? Um, what is it? Movie, Movie Nights, I think, is her channel. And, uh, uh, yeah, Alison Pregler. She's going by her own name now, if you want to look up her channel. She reviewed one of the movies, and she pointed out, like, you can see on their faces they don't want to be here. They don't want to be doing this. And, like... How did that not make the crew, like, stop and say, okay, I can't, this is unacceptable. We can't be treating these children like, like, just products. Anyway, you know, Elizabeth Olsen, at age 21, in only her second role, other than when she was a kid with the twins, she has an, an innocence, an almost virginal purity that we see the cult, cult corrupt and that's also important that because we do see we we see not a spoiler we see the first scene when she's at the compound with the cult and yeah you know warm smile and and like yeah f full of life and hope she she legitimately feels like this is it i've finally found a place where i can just be and people aren't treating me badly and it just it's soul crushing to see the the yeah the way that she gradually she she smiles less and and she's sad more and she's like lowering her head and and you know she she's afraid to make eye contact and all these things and just yeah it's she she is she if this movie had been the first thing i'd seen her in I might well have gone to every single movie that she appeared in, and ultimately, like, I understand that some of them are, so I'm just really quickly, yeah, she actually, she has not been in that many movies, and, like, a bunch of them are her as, in, in the MCU. Yeah, six MCU appearances out of 20 movies total. Yeah, like, Godzilla, I hear, is, like, you know, the, the 2014 one, I hear, is not particularly good, and with respect for the people who helped make Old Boy, I do think Spike Lee has done incredible work, but, to, to be clear, I have not watched either Old Boy, but... I hear that the original is far superior, and and I've I've seen people say that it appeared that maybe Spike Lee didn't completely understand the original work, and uh, yeah, big fan of Spike Lee. Unfortunately, he does sometimes make 
decisions that that yeah I but but you know I uh, let's see I I have to admit I haven't watched that much of his work but I do think he did an incredible job let's see so the yeah the ones I have watched are he got game and inside man and I have to admit, it's been a lot of years since I watched He Got Game. What can I say? There was a while where I watched every movie that Mila Jovovich was in uh, that I could get my hands on. I remember it as as being good. And certainly, you know, Denzel, I don't know if he's capable of, of delivering a bad performance. Oh, right, Rosario Dawson, McBaby. Yeah, I... I I think I have to, John Turturro. I think I gotta rewatch this movie. But but yeah, you know, I I really appreciate that. You know, it is this like, it's a movie written and directed by a black man. The the stars are black men, and it's telling a story that is like you know. Um, I'm just briefly gonna read. Yeah, a basketball player's father must try to convince him to go to a college so he can get a shorter sentence. You know, the the um this this idea of black young black men don't have their fathers because they've been incarcerated. You know, that is that is not the kind of story that you know, white people with with us white people would think of. But it is an important story to tell because, yeah, you know, I, I, I myself lost, I lost my mother when I was young. So, yeah, uh, your relationship with your parents and you having parents is extremely important. And, yeah, also, if white people made that movie, it would probably end up kind of racist you know but but yeah and and inside man i do legitimately think is holy crap he directed the headlights the mm featuring nate rest the music video for that i i didn't realize he still directed music videos i i knew he started out that is an amazing music video okay i i gotta make sure to what's I really wish that the music videos would be separate. Yeah, he has 63 credits, but a bunch of them are music videos. But yeah, you know, like Chirac, Black KK Klansman, you know, these are movie The Five Bloods. I've heard that I definitely should watch these movies. So, yeah. But the... But yeah, you know, I'm I'm really glad that Elizabeth Olsen, you know, they they realized that they had an incredible talent here, so they've given her in the MCU some really strong material, you know. I yeah, let's be honest. I love the MCU, but sometimes they really underserve their their female characters, and Scarlet Witch is probably the single most complex. And yes, part of that is that she's had so many appearances, she's had all these, you know, she's had a lot of screen time that allow her to, to develop complexity. But she really, like, there's a lot of actors who would not be able to do everything that uh, Wanda Maximoff calls for. You know, in so back to this movie, her body language frequently communicates an intense level of anxiety and discomfort. An amazing debut. And John Hawks plays Patrick. I don't know why it took me so long, but it took me a while to realize just how talented he is. You know, for a while, John Hawks was the, you know, he, I mostly remembered him for the start of From Dusk Till Dawn, you know, and he's excellent there, for sure, but he's capable of so much more, and this, he's him, he's amazing here. You can understand how he lures people in, he, he speaks softly, even when criticizing, you know, he'll, with, with the smile, I, I, I'm not gonna imitate it, that would be creepy, but yeah, he'll, he'll smile at a young woman and say, I don't think I'm gonna I'm not gonna imitate him at all. He'll just he'll say, I'm not telling you not to smoke, 
it's your body i just wish you you know respected yourself enough to do the, you know and he he offers a lot this place is yours as much as it is mine, she says about the farm, pays many compliments, you are a teacher and a leader, but when he has you close, he starts to reveal his true colors, and when you start to think about some of the things he says, which obviously you can't if you already feel you need to be a member of this cult, and, and also, you know, they don't call it a cult, they just say where we live, or, you know, the, the farm or something. You know, yeah, you realize some of these things he says aren't as good as they sound at first, I'm not telling you not to smoke is passive aggressive. Of course he's telling her not to smoke. Why else would they even be talking about it? Like in real life, if a smoker and a non-smoker have conversations every so often and neither of them bring up the idea of the smoker quitting smoking, then that's not something the non-smoker ever has to say. Like I've I've had you know, yeah, I've 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 had friends who smoked and like in certain con in certain contexts i might i don't think i ever have directly said to someone i don't think you should smoke but you know yeah and and i've never the the um yeah the people that you know yeah the the people who were who were smoking i never got the sense that they felt like i thought they should quit so it just never you know yeah because at, at the end of the day, like, obviously you can't smoke if you're underage. You shouldn't smoke if you're underage. Once you're an adult, I do think that it is ultimately your own decision. But, like, if you if you want to quit, you should get help to quit. But, yeah, in this movie, like, it's not someone who actually wants to quit smoking. It's someone who is smoking. Patrick doesn't like it. So he tries to, to push her out. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, you know, he he says something like, "I just wish you had enough self-respect, if you know, for your body, you know, self-respect and respect for your body to quit smoking," which is just nuclear grade passive aggressiveness. And you know, yeah, he says this place is as much yours as it is as it is mine, but she doesn't get to influence the rules for living in that place. You are a teacher and a leader. Obviously, feels good to be told. But what is he actually talking about? A leader of what and who? A, a teacher of what and who? A leader of who and to what end? You know, the, just, yeah. You know, you are a teacher and a leader. I I am? I am, yeah. That, you know, that makes me feel good. That's that's a good, you know. But, yeah. What, what is... Yeah. And... Sarah Paulson plays Lucy, and yeah, one critic, if I want to quote, I often have a strong reaction to Sarah Paulson, but I realize now that clearly that is intentional. Other than this, I've seen her in The Spirit, yes, yes, I know, and Glass, and in all three of these, she is really good at playing this overbearing kind of uptight character. She's absolutely perfect for this role, and I've seen her in interview, you know, this is, like, she plays characters like this, but in, you know, she doesn't appear to actually be that way, it's just something she's good at doing on screen, you know, on, on camera. And according to IMDb Trivia, Elizabeth Olsen and Sarah Paulson invented together some background for the sisters' relationship, so every scene where they, when they talk about the past, although it's vague in the script and for the viewer, Olsen and Paulson knew exactly what Martha and Lucy are talking about. And that is just, I love that. That's, that's absolutely perfect. The, the, um, yeah. B because the characters know what they're talking about. So it makes sense for the actors too, as well. And let's see. Yeah, and Hugh Dancy plays Ted, and one critic says he's sympathetic for the frustrating situation in which he finds himself, and frustrating in his own right for not being more patient with Martha. His character isn't quite as developed as I would have liked, but I think the actor does a great job in bringing out some of his depth. I would have to agree. He does try to be helpful, but he really does not know how to deal with Martha. You know, and... and 
yeah, you know, very early on, you might wonder why why is he so like why exactly is he like this? There is a line, um, is it maybe halfway through the movie, where he really, you know, yeah, he he expresses very clearly why the the situation is, yeah. And Brady Corbett plays Watts, who is basically Patrick's right hand and. Yeah, he also does an incredible job, and he's actually, I th I want to say, is he the only person who is in both this and, let's see, I'm just really quickly going to look up the short film. Oh, right, I can't believe I forgot, Sean Durkin did direct some TV episodes, Dead Ringers and South. Cliff. Oh, actually, the Dead Ringers thing might have been... That doesn't come out until next year. That might have been added since I started these notes. Is Dead Ringers... Is that like... Because there's a... There's a Dead Ringers by... Um, yeah. It is a TV show based on the David Cronenberg movie. That makes so much sense. I could totally see him dealing with the kind of psychodrama that that Cronenberg. Yeah. Okay. I I don't watch very many shows, but I might have to for this one. Brady Corbett is the only person who appears in both of the. I I believe yes, and yeah, he just he does an incredible job. There's there's uh. There's a, a very strong presence. Like, he doesn't have to raise his voice. He doesn't have to yell. Because just the way he carries himself, you can tell that he's in charge. You know, it's it's somewhat like, you know, speaking of teachers, like, if you know, yeah, school teachers, you know, not all, but some of them carry themselves in a way where, you know, they, they, they're not allowed to hit the kids. And they might get in trouble with one of the parents if they shout at one of the kids or spend a lot of time yelling at them. But yeah, the way they carry themselves is just... Ah, what's the word? The way they carry themselves makes it clear that they are the one in control. And I think... Yeah, I will also just... the The performance... What was her name? Right, Julia Garner. Wow, she was... So she was 17 when they... Yeah. She gave an absolutely incredible... I, I'm going to have to see her in more stuff. I've only seen her in this and Sin City of Dames Killed for... I know, I know. Let's see. Is she in anything that I already am looking to? Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I gotta watch her more. She, she is really, really, she, she doesn't have an absolutely huge amount of screen time, but she is, uh, I guess, uh, is that name of this? Well, she's, she's significant. And she also, like, there is this, um, you almost get the sense that, you know, if she, if she stays with the cult, she could end up in, you know, as a situation that's as bad as the, the, yeah, the one that led Martha to flee. Now, let's see. So, so yeah, you know, especially well-written characters should not only make you care about them when you're seeing them in on the screen, you should also believe that they exist outside of the film. You should want to know about them, even while you realize that outside of sequels and such, they won't canonically exist outside of the film. You know, or deleted scenes for different strips or like, and 
yeah, this movie, like, I, I want to know, and I, I think it's good that I don't, because it, it wouldn't, it would, it could never live up to my expectations. I want to know what happened when the, you know, when the two sisters were, were kids, you know, because, yeah, you know, like, one of them went to college and got a job and is making a lot of money and is, like, you know, she, she was, like, she got away from, like, she was, she was really worried that she would end up stuck. And the other one maybe kind of was stuck, you know, and it got so bad that she ended up joining a cult. Like, cults try to, to be very, you know, when, when they're just, when, when a new member is, is coming in, they try to, you know, be all smiles and put on the, the, you know, put on a happy face, all that kind of thing. But it's still the kind of thing where, like, there are there the the social isolation and the the this this thing of a a living situation where one person has an extreme amount of control over the the other people you know these are red flags you you should not you should pretty quickly say you know there's something wrong here you know no, no disrespect you know i i 100% I completely understand people who did end up joining cults. You know, it yeah, you feel like there's a there's something missing and maybe the cult can yeah. I personally don't find any of the characters in this annoying. I do understand why others do. I definitely think it easily could have ended up with like um yeah, it could have ended. I've, I've, I have in the past found many movie characters frustrating. I try not to anymore, but it does still like probably the last time it happened to to really strong extent. I re yeah, I remember being extremely frustrated with some of the characters and their actions in Resident Evil the. The final chapter, I think it was called. So that was definitely, but yeah, you know, there are there are characters in this movie where, like, there's a lot of times when they're doing things that you, as a viewer, wish they did differently. There are a number of times where Martha will do something socially unacceptable, and be confused that Lucy and Ted react negatively. I think. <sighs> If the, uh, let's see, right, the, the, yeah, you know, they do try to be patient with her and, uh, you know, yeah, if, if the, if they express very little patience and tolerance for her, then it would get annoying, but I would primarily be annoyed with them. But, you know, freq frequently, Ted will just make a snide comment and not really get involved. And, you know, Lucy, in, in some situations, she berates Martha. But other times, she's very motherly, very reassuring, very, you know, very patient. And... Um, right, yeah, the, the, um, Sean Durkin, in interview, let's see, yeah, you know, he, he cast a bunch of indie film, like, apparently they got big since then, Julia Garner, Brady Corbett, Christopher Abbott, Sarah Paulson, you know, the, the, and yeah, Durkin worked as an assistant for 
cat for uh, right for his casting director Susan Shopmaker while in college at NYU filing headshots doing submissions and then he started to run camera for her in sessions worked on a lot of movies as her casting assistant and let's see yeah yeah and you know he he watched all these incredible actors who were young clearly on the verge of getting roles but not getting them and that's why he tried to make sure, right yeah and he met he, he knew Chris Maria Brady and Julia from being in that office and and it yeah it really shows it does it like I don't particularly know the the actors in this but yeah the the you know I don't doubt for a second that Sean Durkin knew that they would be able to do a good job with the roles he gave them you know there's there's a every single performance here is just spot on and the dialogue the, the IMDb quote section has 15 entries and all 15 of them are good and yeah, you know, diff the different characters speak in specific and different ways, and, you know, the dialogue is often a good way to, to kind of point to kind of the, the what people are thinking about, you know, what, what do they, what do they start talking about when they're alone, for example, and, yeah. So the cinematography was handled by Jody Lee Lipes, who has 16 credits for shorts as a cinematographer, 12 TV, and 11 movies. And yeah, the yeah, and according to Wikipedia, Durkin and DP Jody Lee Lipes were inspired by the films Rosemary's Baby, Three Women, Clute, Interiors, and Margot at the Wedding. The look of the film, the look of the film was particularly inspired by the last film, so Margot at the Wedding. And to quote critics, mesmerizing cinematography, stunning camera work, fine editing, and let's see. shot in long, quiet takes of bucolic ideals and eerily distant and then uncomfortably close which reflects Martha's psyche in an interesting way part of Durkin's game is how he shoots Martha played by with one by yeah Durkin's camera is constantly lurking over her supple curvy body teaching us the teasing us the audience as was well the characters in the film a subtle trick which supports his theme of sexual exploitation and Patrick's use of sex as a tool for psychological dominance while Durkin sometimes follows his heroine around with a handheld camera to emphasize her anxiety the shots in Connecticut are generally steady ref reflecting its relative stability at the farm, the camera often slowly tracks forward, playing on horror movie conventions to suggest a vague menace. Let's see. Yeah, and this was edited by Zachary Stuart Pontier, who has only edited four films in total. And let's see. Worked with the cinematographer on. Let's see. Well, at least one of them and let's see. yeah the editing I've already talked about the the smooth the transitioning between uh, you know past yeah the cult and and present day and yeah other than that like it is also just I really love that. Yeah, it's not a spoiler to say the the present day scenes are in chronological order. Once she's with Lucy and Ted, the things that happen are shown to us in chronological, you know, in the order in which they happened. But when it goes back, the the flashbacks 
are wildly out of order. And yeah, the the you know, because A lot of, I, I, it kind of feels like when we see a flashback in the movie, that is Martha remembering it while, you know, yeah, maybe while asleep, you know, during the, the time at, at Lucy and Ted's summer home. And she's basically just trying to make sense of it, you know? Because, like, because that's, the, that's, you know, a well-known trauma response is to try to make sense of the things that hurt, the things that made, you know, you just, you just want to make sense of, of the world again. You, you can't, and, and, yeah, you know, that's not, not everything that, not all the flashbacks are negative. Some of them, like, you really understand why you know, someone who feels like she has nowhere else to go, like, I mean, that's one thing, but sh it does seem, they, they seem happy, and it seems like a nice place, you know, like, of, of, you know, it's a, it's a farm, they're not, like, unhoused or something, but the, yeah, you know, she's trying to make sense of it, and so are we, and ultimately, like, once you watch the entire movie, you can put most of the movie, most of the flashbacks, you can put in chronological order. But, yeah, the, the, as you're just experiencing the movie, it really does feel like we are, you know, picked up and plopped right inside the, the mind of Martha. Now, the movie does not have a lot of stunt work, but what little there is really is very effective. And let's see. So the right, the budget was six hundred thousand dollars, and the box office was five point four million dollars. And I mean, they they did a really good job. It it doesn't like I mean. Even if it's the first independent movie you see, you'll be able to tell, okay, this did not have like $200 million behind it. This is this is somewhat more low budget. But yeah, you know, this movie, like, you know, we're, we're getting Halloween ends pretty soon. You know, the original 1978 Halloween is also, it was made on a shoestring budget, but it doesn't look cheap. You know, and there's a lot of movies that imitated that movie that look very cheap, that look as cheap as they are. You know, it takes a lot of talent to disguise, a, you know, a lack of funds. And, yeah, I mean, yeah, they did an incredible... I, I mean, probably the fact that the, the camera work, editing, and acting are so strong, you know, and, and that it has such a good script, such good direction, you know, it does, yeah, it does not feel often when you look at movies that are, that were made for little money, you know, the people who worked on it aren't famous and they, you know, not necessarily always the most talented and such. And, and for sure, like, it's, it definitely is a thing, is a thing that affects you know, yeah, by 2011, even though you didn't have a huge amount of money, you could still get a pretty good camera and editing, uh, the, the, uh, what's the editing, uh, setup, you know, so it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't look Roger Corman cheap, but yeah, it definitely deserved to, to make, okay, so 605.4, just really quickly gonna so let's see I guess so it's nine times it it made back yeah it made back nine times what it cost and I don't think they spent a lot on marketing so that is that is a very strong return on investment I have no idea like so it made money critics liked it 
it won awards I'm not sure why this movie did not I don't know I mean I guess it's possible he just this was the big idea he had and that's why it took so long for Sean Durkin to make a second movie but yeah I certainly hope I, I don't I, th I think this movie showed he deserved to, to make you know I mean this is if if I had watched this in 2011 I would probably have figured you know this is this is going to be like I can't believe I'm blanking on his name but I can look it up lickety split Darren Aronofsky you know who started with Pi in 98 and by now he has directed Okay, nine movies. Uh, that one is a music video. But yeah, you know, in... Yeah, yeah. So, over the course of 24 years, he has directed nine movies. You know, I, I would have guessed that that would... That would be what Sean Durkin... But, yeah. Let's see. So, the... Yeah, unsurprisingly, this was shot on location, so they did actually go to the Catskill Mountains. And let's see. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> as far as the horror, it's the the it uses a lot of of tension and the sort of normalization of extremes. It's not a gory or bloody movie, and we don't see a huge amount of violence, actually. And the composer the, of, of the score is Danny Benzi, who has scored 50 movies in total from back in 2020, 2010, so yeah, in a little over a decade. Yeah, and I am not really familiar with. Oh right, yeah, he also the. Yeah, Danny. Yeah, I I believe I'm gonna double check. I believe Danny. Danny Benzi is male, but I am gonna double check. Yes, Danny Benzi. Also, he also scored Enemy, which is also also an excellent movie. There are a couple of things about it. I don't. I think it is it is it is a really good movie, and it is a deeply compelling experiment that is not one hundred percent successful. But I really admire the ambition. But yeah, the the and and that movie does also have really great like it, um, is that I mean no you shouldn't listen to the music without watching the movie but you know it is a movie made by the director named Denis Villeneuve and don't feel bad if you don't know I've I before watching the the oh wait, let's see yeah it was it's, i i watched like a dozen different interviews where the the you know someone working on blade runner 2049 had to say his name they had to practice i had to practice we all have to practice you know he's he's like fr uh let's see french canadian yes and yeah um, Denis Villeneuve, you know, uh, other than, yeah, Prisoners, Enemy, and Blade Runner 2049, I have watched, and, yeah, uh, once again, Enemy, not completely successful, but Prisoners and Blade Runner 2049 are some of the best movies that I have ever seen, so, I don't know, I guess I have to learn... Uh, for French and try to watch some of his earlier movies. I, yes, I know, I know. You don't have to tell me. I need to watch Sicario, Arrival, and Dune. 
<sighs> probably will at some point. Um, yeah. But yeah, an unbelievably talented director. Um, incredible movie, incredible score. And oh, right, right, there were two. And the other one is named Sonder Jorians. And yeah, so the 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 score is simple but incredibly effective. There, there's only a few instruments, and the chord progressions sound basic, but they're haunting. And those sharp notes cut into your soul. Like, it is just... Yeah, and, you know... Some... some yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and quote a fellow critic. The background score may as well be non-existent. I think it is used exactly the right amount. And just, yeah, you know, I, I listened to it separately from watching the movie. And, you know, I, I would say watch the movie first. But, yeah, if afterwards you, you want, you know, some of the score is right here on YouTube, uh, you know, to, to listen to for free. And, yeah, it really is. You know, and, and yeah, I it's possible that part of it was mon monetary, you know. Every single person playing an instrument has to be paid, you know, and the amount, the, the, the time that the composers spend working out the chord progressions and recording the music costs money, you know, so maybe there was a very limited there, but I would not, oh, I can't even, I think this movie would be completely ruined by like a you know, a, a grand orchestral score, uh, you know, something like X-Men 2, for example, that has an excellent score. I love, you know, the, yeah, but that would not work at all for this movie and vice versa. And the, the, yeah, I, I'm really, really glad that, you know, like, if this movie was made today, yeah, it's, you know, Elizabeth Olsen's fee alone would, you know, it would have to be a much bigger budget for them to, to be able to do it. And I just, I don't think it would be as good. And that's not, you know, she's still incredibly talented. Like, I have issues, I do, with Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, while Elizabeth Olsen is absolutely astounding in the movie like i don't th i think some of the material really fails her but her performance holy crap and the the sound design is also really strong like there are times where like, I didn't even realize it before I, 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 yeah, when I watched it again, I realized, oh, hey, we never actually saw that. Spoilers. I'm, I'm not saying it because I'd be spoiling something. Because I heard it. When I watched the movie, I heard it, and the, the noise put an image in my head, so I felt like I had seen it. And it was only, you know, when I watched it again, I was like, oh, right, I completely forgot. That was, that was not how I quite remember that, because, the, you know, and that's especially true of horror, you know, because our, our, that's one of the primary reasons that, you know, the, the average human has pretty good hearing. We have to be able to recognize the sounds of danger. And, yeah, you know, that is a, a, it's not the only, but it is a really big reason why we evolved such, because, you know, if if you don't have any issues there, then the average human being has pretty good hearing. You know, we, we have better hearing than sometimes, like, I hear so many people say, oh, you know, if only we could fly, well, then we'd have other problems. Look at the problems that birds deal with in part because they've evolved to, to be able to, to fly really well, you know. Anyway, we, you know, we, we can hear really well. 
I'll grant that there are animals who can hear significantly better, but yeah, and, and when we hear a, a noise that tells our brain danger, it's, you know, yeah, you, you, you don't have to show as much as you might think. And again, I'm almost certain that part of it was a, a budgetary issue. You know, I, I could go through the movie and point to, you know, they actually, they don't spend money, like, very, very obviously, very visibly, any more than they can, you know, and, and that's, like, right now, I'm, I'm watching the Netflix Marvel shows, you know, and those, like, yeah, not a spoiler, there's, there's one of them where a character, like, breaks a, a window, and it, let's see, I think, break a window and a door, and then reach in and open the door and walk through the door. And I couldn't help but notice that they didn't actually show the glass being broken. They they play the noise of glass being broken, and then the camera pans over, and we see the character reach in, you know, uh, yeah, use the, the doorknob, open the door, and walk in. And that's because if they have to film that, like, five times... Well, if they have to break glass all those times, you know, I mean, okay, broken glass, not the most expensive thing for a movie shoot, but it adds up, you know, it, it costs money, it takes time, which also costs money, you know, so yeah, they just, they, they tell you that the glass was smashed with the noise, and then they get, you know, because if all you got to do to reset is have the actor walk back out the, the door and close the door, and then, like, have their hand ready to stick in as soon as the camera pans on. That's a lot easier, you know. And I think I, I, I'm I starting to sound a little, like, I... That sounded like a diss. I want to make it clear. I love... I've, I've so Okay, so far, I've watched all of season one of Daredevil, which I love. Jessica Jones, which... One of the... Like, I... I love it so much. And the first half of Daredevil Season 2, I'm watching them in the order that they premiered on Netflix originally. And, yeah, so far I love every episode. So, right, quoting a fellow critic here, Ambient, moody sounds and amplified background noises have us paying attention to every detail in the film. Moments of eerie silence or chilling and obtuse framing in certain scenes have us anticipating fits of violence, sometimes paying off, sometimes not. And that is also, like, sound work on a movie, not hugely expensive, not something that takes an absolute eternity. Now, let's see... Yeah, so the pacing is definitely uneven, and some people find that very frustrating. I thought it made absolutely perfect sense. The uh, an even pace is something we've by now become accustomed to, but it's really not very natural. It's it's not it's not lifelike, you know. And that's you know we accept a lot of things that aren't lifelike for regular movies. But sometimes it's good to, to, like, I've thankfully never experienced anything even remotely as extreme as Martha has. But I've had plenty of times in my life where something would suddenly happen, even though I wasn't necessarily expecting, or some, or a long time would pass without something happening that I was anticipating, you know. So, yeah, the movie feels more like real life. And that's, again, that's something that appears to have bothered people and I can understand why uh, you know this is not escapism this is not a movie you put on to get away from the negative things in life but then I'm not sure I would say you know and just horror movies in general should not make you feel safe or coddled to you know so yeah, the movie is an hour and 37 minutes long without end credits and 42 and a half long with them. So yeah, you know, it really is not a movie that at all, you know, if, if a movie isn't 100% like, uh, what's the word? 
if a movie there if you're not absolutely loving a movie then it really matters if that movie is three hours long or 90 minutes or what and yeah I guess yeah, it's difficult to say how much of it you should watch I yeah I would say if you watch the first 30 minutes and you're then not at all interested in anything else from the movie yeah the the movie does not yeah if if that doesn't make you want to make to to see the rest of the movie you yeah you don't have to watch any further i i would say you've you know yeah i i I know how you know it, it really sucks when you watch a movie and you really hate it and just it feels like it takes forever and such so yeah so the best element is the way that it goes between memories from the two years and present day and I would say it's worth watching the movie at least once just to experience that and honestly you know it's worth owning like if if I didn't if it wasn't on Disney plus I would probably want to own a DVD copy of it to just like and and that's the thing you know now that it's on stream you know you're it's definitely not gonna mess up your you know if if you have a DVD and you're skipping back and forth that can be a little hard on the disc but on streaming no such problem I recommend sitting and watching and just take some of the individual scenes and maybe like try to mentally completely put the movie in cor correct chronological order and such because it really you know yeah I did that I found it very rewarding so let's see the yeah I'm supposed to talk about the worst aspect um I don't know that I think there is um yeah, yeah. I I don't really I I there's there's no major bad thing about this movie in in my opinion. I will definitely say, you know, the title will dissuade some people who might end up loving the movie. I personally do love the title and by the time you've watched the entire movie, you will understand the title. And yeah, in general, there are a number of things about the movie you'll only understand a while into the movie or once you've watched the entire thing. And I love that about it. And yeah, so according to others, the worst thing about the movie is that it's boring, slow, and doesn't know what it wants to be. And I think I've made it quite clear by now, I completely disagree with those criticisms. Now, the thing I was most worried about, you know, having done a tiny bit of research, I worried that it was going to be confusing. And it's confusing some of the time and certain like I would say once once you've watched it once you've watched the entire thing a lot of things will become clearer and you know you can yeah I'm I'm going to be talking about some of my you know some of the things in the spoiler sections so and yeah the but yeah, you know, the I did not think that it was a problem that the movie was at times confusing. The thing I was most looking forward to was the exploration of trauma, and the movie exceeded my expectations. Now, the trailers do give away too much. Uh, there, There's a... let's see, I found... There we go. There's a two and a half minute official and a two and a half minute international trailer both of them definitely give at least a little bit too much away and ultimately I don't know how it's very difficult to get audience attention for this kind of movie without spoiling in two and a half minutes and that's also something I noted like there's one part of it where like they trimmed it down a little they trimmed out pauses between sentences but they almost took like 
they took a chunk of an of they, they took yeah they took almost the entire scene didn't they and put in the trailer because it's very very difficult to to like imply to to hint at with this movie you know you kind of do have to yeah and and it doesn't yeah you know if you if you don't mind spoilers the trailers do give you a good idea of how of what the movie is like with the caveat that once again it's very difficult to advertise this kind of thing in so little time and yeah the, the covers and posters do not give too much away none of them do and some of them I'd, I'd say if you like the posters and covers with arguably one or two exceptions they do give you an idea of what a good idea of what the movie's like and they're definitely worth looking up on IMDb and yeah so on Rotten Tomatoes this has 90% on the tomato meter and based on 211 reviews and 71 audience score 71 percent based on over 10,000 ratings and the critics consensus led by a mesmerizing debut performance from Elizabeth Olsen Martha Marcy May Marlene is a distinctive haunting psychological drama and of the 211 reviews, 189 of them are fresh. Only 22 are rotten. And the average rating is 7.80 out of 10. And the audience score, 71% voted 3.5 stars or higher. And the average rating is 3.6 out of 5. And yeah, it is certified fresh. And on Metacritic, it has 75 out of 100 for critics, 7.0 out of 10 for users, 39 critic reviews, 45 user reviews, and there's only 223 IMDb user reviews for this movie. That is, wow, I, I mean, I knew that, I, I, I had forgotten in the time since, yeah. I think I end up, ended up reading all of them. I usually just read the top voted 100, but well, there's that few of them. And the top 100 were, let's see, yeah, so 15 were scored 1 out of 10, another 15, 2 out of 10, 5 were 3 out of 10, 10 were 4 out of 10, Fourteen were 5 out of 10 3 were 6 out of 10 15 were 7 out of 10 15 another 15 were 8 out of 10 4 were 9 out of 10 and 5 were 10 out of 10 so yeah the a lot of people really did not a lot of users did not like this movie that much and of the 354 links to external reviews 164 of the links worked and were in English. And yeah, it has a 6.8 out of 10 user rating on IMDb based on 51,933 MDB users. And yeah, 29.6 gave it 7, 22.4 gave it 8, 17.8 gave it 6, let's see, 8.2 gave it 9, 8.0 gave it 5, 4.8, 4, and the rest is 2 or below, so yeah. And... I have already talked some about the let's see. Yeah, I've talked about the the violence some and yeah, so there's not a huge amount of sexual content, but what there is is disturbing and yeah, this is one of the movies that explores what rape does to rape survivors 
and there is some swearing in it it tends to underline like if someone is in an especially distraught situation you know then they'll swear even if they don't normally and I recommend the written reviews of Roger Ebert, R.I.P., and Marianne Johansson. And, yeah. I love this movie, but it does not have any extras on Disney+. Plus. So, you know, if you already have a copy of the movie, or if you're, you know, if there is a... Ah, what's the word? You know, yeah, and if you, if you live in a country that doesn't have... I want to say it's called Star, the Disney Plus add-on thing. You might not be able to watch this. Like I mentioned, it is R-rated. It is not part of the the traditional Disney. Yeah, and you know, yeah. Other than Disney Plus, in some countries, it's right here on YouTube and otherwise Amazon Instant Video, iTunes, Vudu, and Google Play. But yeah, no no special features for it on the. On, on Disney Plus, I I think it would be, you know, putting putting the short film up, for example, I think would be would make a lot of sense. I guess, is it possible that it is somewhere else? Let's see. What if I right? Um. Yeah, it does not appear to be. Um, I guess I will just very briefly check if the, let's see, here we go, and it is not on Disney Plus. So, yeah. And yeah, the I um I guess if if I have to be 100% objective, this movie is a 9 out of 10. I I I think an argument could be made that there are a few things. Oh, huh. My review ended up as long as the movie is. An hour and 37 minutes. Personally, it is a perfect 10 out of 10, and I I might watch this soon. I, I might watch this later again today. You know, this is, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's unreal how good this movie is. And that brings us to the thoughts sections. So... Gonna put up the spoiler tag and right. So notes taken while watching. So despite Sarah looking sad and looking like she's reconsidering being with the cult at the start, when she spots Martha, we immediately feel a sense of threat. Even if Sarah agrees with Martha leaving, she knows she has to tell the others that Martha is leaving, and. You know, something that's also, you don't realize it at this point, but as far as I can tell, Sarah has not gone on one of the, the you know, she hasn't graduated to the level of being allowed out on the, you know, when they, when they break into people's houses, you know, so she hasn't seen them kill anyone, so she might actually be confused and surprised that Martha is leaving. Very clever of Martha to hide in the woods instead of trying to outrun them all. I, I would almost definitely say some of them run faster than she does. And almost right after we see Martha eating and drinking, the guy shows up and she's like shivering. And he specifically says that he doesn't want to order anything and then eats her food right in front of her. And the phone call goes through so many stages. Martha struggles to eat breakfast near Ted. Lucy puts more on her plate. And I, I really love the, the, you know, she asks 
how far are we? You know, she doesn't even think to say, you know, and, and then, then Lucy asks, away from what? And Martha says, yesterday, you know, the, like she's, because to her, it's like there's the, there's the cult and then there's now. Lucy still perceives the rest of the world and time. She does, it, at first, it doesn't even really occur to her that Martha, I mean, she's, she's basically, she's, she's becoming worse at communicating reality and, and memories to, to Lucy. And, and part of that is that she hasn't been allowed to process things, you know, when, when something bad happens that, you know, around the cult, they talk about what a good thing it is, unless someone, uh, unless a cult member is misbehaving, that's a bad thing. But other than that, and Lucy gets Martha smoothies and protein bars since Martha is malnourished. If she can't eat, eat much regular food, protein bars are the best snack for her. You know, it, it is a good, like, she is approaching it very logically, Lucy is. And, you know, Martha comes to after the, the rape and... Uh, what was what was her name? Um, Zoe says it's good if you can't remember things. That means the cleansing worked. And she said you need to share yourself. Don't be selfish. And you know she manages to talk Martha into saying, "Yeah, it was, it was good." So smile, you know, and and just the these these little verbal manipulations where, if, yeah. And Sarah says that she's tried every drug other than heroin. And so he says, that's good. You should try everything at least once. That's how you learn who you are. I do not judge people who do drugs. But if you at all can avoid starting, avoid starting. And while obviously very uncomfortable to watch, the bedwetting underlines how traumatized Martha is. And, you know, Martha says, do you ever have that thing where you're not sure if something's a memory or if you dreamt it? And Lucy doesn't even quite know how to respond. You know, she, she kind of says, um, no, and, and she like chuckles and it's like, yeah, you know, she legitimately can't. And, and you know, yeah, it's, it's a sign of trauma. And, and right there, like, Lucy should make sure that Martha can talk to some, like, Lucy appears to think that if she gives Martha enough time, if she doesn't push her, then Martha will readjust as, you know, she, she really does not understand the, the level of trauma. You know, like, like seriously, if someone tells you that they're struggling to tell those two things apart, you know, try to get, not, not like institutionalized or anything, but like, to try to make sure that there's someone they can talk to because that really that yeah that is not healthy martha is surprised that ted cooks sometimes that it's not only something for the women to do and when martha calls she finds that zoe is missing and yeah you know gradually like the 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 various cult members do end up feeling to, you know, we, we don't hear if Max leaves, but I would definitely understand if he does after Patrick tells Martha to shoot him. And yeah, you know, maybe eventually it did get to Zoe that they killed a man, or maybe it happened again. Maybe this time she had to partake in that. Or, you know, maybe, yeah, it, it, I, I think I'm gonna gonna to go with that to not yeah. And let's see. And Lucy says that Martha looks pretty, and Martha doesn't seem to want that. Probably just reminds her of the rape. I do like you know in one bit of emotional intelligence the the you know when like Martha doesn't really want Lucy to take a, a Polaroid picture of her, 
that's another thing. That's off screen, isn't it? Because, you know, Polaroids do cost money. So they just have her act it out. And then in post, they add in the recognizable Polaroid noise. Because we don't actually see, we don't see the picture be printed out. We don't see the picture as she's holding it. We just, we see her looking at something. We assume it's the picture, you know, but yeah. But the, the, yeah. Martha doesn't want to smile. You know, Lu Lucy starts by saying, you, uh, let's see, what was it? You, you look gorgeous. Because that's the kind of, you know, that is, you know, what, what was that thing? There's like a photo series of like, you know, a photographer took the, the, the people's picture once, just, you know, asking them, can I take your picture? And took the picture. And then, and then after taking that first picture, they said, you look amazing. And then they took their picture and they're, you know, beaming, huge smile on their face, you know. So, yeah, Lucy thought that that, 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 Martha would like that. But when it doesn't, then she follows it up with, it's a, it's really, what was it? It's a real pain in the ass or it's really pissing me off. It's, it's actually kind of annoying or something like that, you know? So, so yeah, you know, and that makes her chuckle and that gets the smile that she wanted for the, the picture. And at first, Martha doesn't really want to talk to anyone at the park. And and it's such a great, like, you know, she, she walks down and, like, she, you know, Lucy spots her and is like, oh, everyone, this is my sister. And Martha, she doesn't, she doesn't even excuse herself. She just kind of walks past because she doesn't, she doesn't remember how you're supposed to be in this situation. Like, I... I'm not great at meeting new people and socializing at parties and stuff like that. But like, if someone was trying to introduce me to someone else and I really, really did, like, I felt a lot of social anxiety about it, I wouldn't just walk away. I'd be like, I, I, sorry, I, I gotta go do something or something, you know. But yeah, she's just so used to not, yeah. And the moment that she thinks she recognizes a cult member, Mike, she confronts him, and it really, it's its such a great, because, like, she, it was almost kind of, like, maybe a little aimless before, and I, I don't know, maybe she was always going there to, to have something to drink, but once she, you know, and, and the way she talks to him is also, like, you know, he's there, as, as a bartender, he, like, I'm not sure he necessarily knows any of the, because they're, like, they're fairly well-to-do. I, I don't think people like that really have one of their friends tend bar, you know, that's something, yeah, so, so, you know, they, they hired this guy, he's not expecting anyone to talk to him other than to order drinks, so, like, when she, and, and, yeah, she's like, what's your name, you know, she, she's, like, interrogating him, basically, and, yeah, you know, she thinks that a cult member has infiltrated this party and is going to attack her and the others. And she's basically, because, yeah, the way she talks to him is kind of the way that Patrick talks to her and others. You know, so, so she thinks that it, it's almost like, a, in, in part, it's what she's learned. She has now learned that if you, you know, yeah, for one thing, that it's okay to talk to people like that, it's not. And for another, that this is how, like, if, if you're in a situation that you want to take control of, you, you talk to people like that, you know, that's, so yeah, that's one of the things. Another thing is, yeah, you know, she, she thinks that she's outmaneuvering him by, by starting like this you know, on, on some level, she thinks, if I confront him like this, you know, then he'll, you know, I, I don't know if she actually expects him to tell the truth or what, but, you know, yeah, and, and the, the, and, and the discordant music swells as she, you know, really, you know, gets, gets very scared during the party, and, 
The cult being discovered in the house is a masterful scene. So many turns. Like, at first, it's just, you know... Like, to us, it's still really uncomfortable seeing them break into people's houses. But to them, it's like Tuesday, you know? So, yeah. And one of them... You know, and, and yeah, and they're actually... They're surprised to see... You know, they, they don't usually experience it getting caught. And, you know, the, the, let's see, the, the, yeah, you know, he, he shows up and, and he's like, it, yeah, some lines that are, you know, if you calm down, no one will get hurt. We wouldn't have come in if we knew you were here. And, you know, they, they tell him not, not to call the police. And, you know, the, this whole, yeah, the, they realize what would, uh, yeah, I suppose, yes, I, I will just briefly talk about, you know, the scene does kind of uh, raise the question, do they always have someone, you know, like, as far as I can tell, she took the knife from the, the house, the, the one that she stabbed him with. I figure they probably... Yeah, the, the, you know, I, I don't know, I can imagine that he was, he was probably going to, they, they were going to kill him once they, once he spotted them there. But they had to pretend to leave, primarily so he would turn his back, so there wouldn't be a big struggle or anything. You know, and that's also, we don't actually see the knife going into his back and that was something I didn't realize until you know when I re when I did research for this and I I went through the parents guide for example on IMDb I was like oh right we don't see the knife going it's just the the noise is so effective you know and again if they have to set up the the you know the wound every single time and you know but instead all they have to do is act it out and then, you know, someone has to spray some blood on her face that they, that they then wash off. And, yeah, you know, that's much quicker and easier. And, you know, as they start to leave, he says, I just want to make sure my family's safe. And then Patrick stops and turns. Why wouldn't they be? And he's just, yeah. And, and it's really creepy that even in this situation Patrick is still talking in much the same way you know it's this soft spoken like he's not raising his voice and like no one like hypothetically the the number of them if they charged at the homeowner they would probably have been able to subdue him it's possible that he would have gotten some effective punches in for them but they were probably been able to subdue him, but, you know, Patrick would rather the, the, yeah, actually, honestly, maybe that was the backup plan. Like, if the stabbing didn't work out, the, yeah, something like that. And Martha, Martha is the only person frozen in, in fear. The others have experienced it before, the, the stabbing. They probably don't particularly want it to happen, but sometimes it does, and it doesn't make them stop breaking into people's houses. It just made them get better at handling getting caught. And now we completely understand why Martha is so upset by the noise of what Lucy and Ted think are pine cones, and she thinks are small rocks hitting the roof or windows. It makes her think they're coming for her. And we see Martha on the other end of the line as Marlene and the, the camera slowly gets closer and we can see the questions that they have to ask. And we see Katie hit Martha's ear, so that's how it got bruised. And that's also, like, if you're, if you're an adult and you're, like, starting to eat before the food is served, that probably means that you're not eating enough. Like, that is not... <sighs> yeah. And, you know, the thing that Martha 
just, you know, she can't stay on the farm and is after seeing them kill an innocent man. I really appreciate when Patrick manipulates Martha in the bathroom, he walks out of shot but then appears in the mirror. He holds control over her even when not nearby. And then she walks over to him because that is, you know, he is in charge. And in the last scene of the vacation home, Martha dives deep underwater, hoping the cold water will make her cramp up so she'll drown. She would rather suicide than live in an institution, live with these memories. And that brings us to the final section, notes taken before watching. So I am really glad that this does not, so far at least, have sequels. And I think the prequel short is good. I would like for there to be spiritual successors, but not sequels. And not full-length prequels. And... So there are a number of things in the movie you only understand, you know, you don't understand the first time you watch the scene, which, you know, yeah, a lot of movies today are made so that no one is confused because they'll zone out and then they won't recommend the movie to others or, you know, yeah, in the case of streaming, if they hit pause and, you know, stop watching the movie, they might never continue watching the movie so it's very daring I realize this was originally in theaters not it wasn't released to streaming right away but yeah there are a lot of things that you only understand later in the movie and let's see and yeah the the a number of the things we see happen twice and the second time you full you you more greatly comprehend what's going on and the thing is that a lot of the rituals in the cult we see them twice and the first time it's being done to Martha and the second time Martha is helping the cult do it to someone else and you know maybe that's the first time that that's done toward that cult member you know the the let's see. you know the the cult itself is not a person that you know but the the cult has a leader and that leader controls the the you know yeah, he's he's in charge, but he teaches like the you know he's at the top, and the very you know um, yeah you know the very next person is the one who you know he he knows and does almost as much as Patrick, so he does almost as much traumatizing. And and the you know the further down the line you go, the less the the individual member is allowed to traumatize others, and the less they know and and such. You know, early on, Martha and Max don't know what happens when they drive off in the the car. But then when the you know yeah af after she's been there for longer, she gets to go along and yeah that's when she witnesses uh, Katie kill someone and the the you know that's also why she smashes that you know when she's lying in bed she hears a car pull up near and that already has her on edge and then she sees yeah it's the same kind of car you know and ultimately like by the end of the movie we don't know if that car was actually the cult, I, for all we know, maybe it's not there. You know, maybe she is starting to have hallucinations. We know she's struggling to tell apart memory, you know, uh, yeah, memory from dream. She's she can't, 
you know, yeah. And, and the, yeah, on multiple occasions, she sees someone, she thinks that's one of the cult members, come to, to get her, to get revenge, and we never find out for sure if, if they are. You know, it's noteworthy that Ted and Lucy don't see the black, or at least we don't see the reaction to it. Ted and Lucy don't see the guy who's staring at her when she's swimming in, in the last scene of the, and that I do think. I think that's either got to be a cult member or in her head. I really don't think anyone else would just stare like that. But yeah, that's the thing. We we don't know. But but yeah, the let's see. You know, once you've been a member of this cult for long enough, you are guilty of the emotional manipulation of the, you know, the members below you or on the same rank as you you know and and the yeah this this man manipulation makes sure that it is extremely rare for cult members to go against patrick you know what he says and asks for you know if if they don't live up to his expectations he and the other members you know yeah we see them treat martha extremely badly they they behave as if she's being unreasonable even though you know, yeah, these are reasonable things. You know, the, the they tell her to shoot a cat. And, you know, the, the yeah, watching Katie stab an innocent man to death in his own home right in front of, you know, for, for nothing. Just because that's less trouble from the police than, yeah. And, uh, let's see, yeah, and, and the, the, yeah, and after they broke into his home, you know, on, like, that's something, you know, you learn at a, at a young age, it is completely un, uh, unacceptable to break into someone else's place. And, you know, yeah, the first time Patrick rapes her, yeah, the, these are the things that upset her, and they're completely reasonable. You know, it's it's reasonable to be upset by them. You know, and when Patrick is teaching Martha how to fire a gun, he tells her to focus on someone who hurt her. That is some of the worst advice. You know, that that's, yeah, one of the absolute worst things to do when you're dealing with a loaded weapon. That's the kind of thing that makes it easier for you to shoot other people. And obviously, that's what Patrick hopes. You know, the, the. And we don't even have to imagine that he'll eventually ask her to shoot people after shooting cats. And that's, you know, serial killers, a number of them start by, you know, brutally killing small animals and then later start killing human beings. And let's see. Yeah, you know, when Martha says she is not going to shoot the cat, Patrick tells her to shoot Max, which also shows that he's completely indifferent to what the cult members do to each other as long as he maintains control. You know, Patrick never suggests that Martha shoot him. So, you know, yeah, he doesn't care if one of them kills another. That, you know, for one thing, that means that's another cult member that he can trust to kill. It's an, it means that that cult member is less likely to go to the police because she'd be implicating herself. And... Let's see... Yeah, and, and you know, we see that the, the, the members of the cult are young people who don't really have anywhere else to go to get support their family don't help with their issues with drugs and once they're members of the cult they have a very difficult time getting out again because of the emotional manipulation you know the, there's that thing of uh, let's see um the the drug thing that zoe called her father he thinks that she's on drugs 
which she used to be, you know, and he is going to send her money because he's worried that otherwise, you know, she's going to be performing sex acts for the, the drugs or money for drugs. And yeah, you know, right there, like if he thinks that she's having problems with drugs, he should be trying to get her into rehab. You know, he shouldn't be giving money to, but, but yeah, you know, a lot of people are more comfortable with just giving some money to someone that, you know, instead of this harder. And, and I get, you know, it is, I, some members of my family have struggled with addiction. So it, it is difficult to, to help the people who have addiction close to you. And right. I, I want to make sure to say in reality, there isn't anything wrong with like having sex with multiple partners, you know, and, and the, let's see. Yeah, um, sex with multiple partners, bisexual relationships, and unprotected sex, and that kind of thing. Like, as long as everyone has been tested, you don't have to use protection unless you're trying to avoid pregnancy, obviously. And the, uh, let's see, it, yeah, bisexuality is, is not, there's, there's nothing wrong with that and having multiple parts. Yeah. But it is true that, you know, a number of cults has used that, you know, make, make sure, and it does, it means that the, the cult members have a stronger emotional bond with the other members and maybe sometimes also with the cult leader than if there's just absolutely no sex. And yeah, over the course of the movie, we see that Martha's relationship with certain things like nudity have been reprogrammed. You know, she by by the cult, she suddenly doesn't understand why there's something wrong with her being in the bed that her sister is having sex in. She doesn't understand. She can't swim naked in. A public lake like you know this is there are literally laws against that you're not allowed to be naked in a public place and you know you, yeah you should not force nudity upon someone who is not consented personally I look forward to a time when women not wearing shirts in public is seen as equally fine as men not wearing them but she is also bottomless which is not okay in public regardless of gender and you know yeah in reality, she's known these things for a number of years, but within just these two years with the cult, she has internalized these completely different values. And that is what happens when you exist in a in an environment like that. You gotta remember, during all that time, she didn't have any, you know, like she told, she she made sure to tell Sarah after Zoe said that she got some money from her dad, we don't talk to our old families, you know, because the cult is the new family. So there's no need to, you know, it's it's not a good idea to talk to the old family because that is, you know, cults control what you eat. Your they they often strip away your privacy. They will, uh, let's see, they they force you to be isolated from anyone other than the cult and if you break the cult's rules you will be socially isolated within the cult until you agree to follow the rules i feel like there's a couple more it, yeah and and uh, very many uh, a lot of cult leaders will rape the cult members to uh, um for as as a form of domination sexual domination you know, it, it tells them, in it, you know, their lizard brain picks up, okay, I belong to him. He tells me what to do, and I don't get any say of my own. And 
yeah, you know, because the cult broke into houses, Martha is afraid for the entire movie that the cult would come and find her in Lucy's house and punish her. Because the worst thing, you know, to to be the nothing is worse to a cult than a cult member betraying the cult. So so yeah, you know the the. When when we first see that she's scared and Lucy says, "Oh, pine cones! You know, pine cones are hitting the the roof," which is plausible, you know, it, it, dep depending on the season. And I think it is the right, yeah, you know. So, and and then later we see her participate in breaking in. So basically, she, you know, that that's what everything is to her now either something bad being done to her or she did something bad to someone else you know both relating to the cult so she thinks that she's now going to be in a house that is broken into and yeah you know i maybe the, the with within the fiction of the film maybe the cult is after her and certainly like what is she going to do in a house like that you know there's no Ah, what's the word? You know, these these big windows and and a big enough house that like a bunch of that like you know, if if she lived in a really small house where only one person could fit in the hallway at a time, you know, uncomfortable, yes, but at least it's gonna limit how much you know, they they can't surround you right away. You know, so that's the, the yeah. And and you know, yeah, big broad windows and and like because they don't expect anyone to break in you know and let's see and yeah you know i i would say you can read it either way that either the cult is really after her Maybe even, you know, maybe Mike was a, a cult member who, you know, went in there and he's just really good at pretending that he's surprised, you know, or maybe she's so paranoid she can't see straight, she can't perceive the real world the way it is anymore. Now, yeah, you know, the, the movie the very very ending of the movie like like i mentioned in the review i think it is 100% perfect basically you can read it as the the people in that other car and the you know the guy who ran right in front of them they're cult members you know they they did it like the the guy who ran like let's see hypothetically if he knew if he figured that they were going to be driving in that basic direction then you know maybe he's a mile or two down that road and so like he is is yeah he probably just he's maybe let's see the least the the less conspicuous thing would be if he were pretending to jog yeah he's pretending to jog then he spots the car and you know recognizes it as theirs and so he runs out in front of their car so that their car has you know so the Ted has to stop their car and then he runs to the the black car that has you know been following behind and yeah you know now they'll have an easier time of you know I don't know if they're gonna try to ram the car from behind maybe they're gonna try to drive ahead and like block the car from the road you know there are various options you know, what are Ted, Lucy, and Martha going to do? Like, Martha might try to fight back, but the other two don't even know that there's a cult. Like, they they kind of just have to accept that, yeah, you know, Martha was with a boyfriend who lied to her, and she left, and that was, you know, like, they don't know that we're talking about a cult that kills people and let's be honest if she tell like if if when you know whatever it is that happens let's let's say all three of them are still conscious maybe the car is blocking ted's yeah like 
are they going to believe her if she starts, you know, she's, she would probably end up screaming, they're going to kill us all or something like that. And they're going to think, oh no, uh, we got to sedate her again. You know, the, the, and, and that's another, like after sedating her, you know, they, they still don't seem to completely, or at least Lucy doesn't. I, I think Ted maybe does, but he kind of just pushes it down, suppresses it, stiff upper lip, and the whole, you know, that whole thing. And, yeah, Lucy doesn't seem to completely understand or accept. She's not willing to accept. This is not something that she and Ted can do. Martha needs help beyond what they can do for her. Now, let's see. But, but yeah, you know, maybe the cult caught up to them is going to kill all three of them. Or, maybe, yeah, maybe, like, a, a lot of the movie is from Martha's point of view. I'm not sure there's a single scene that doesn't have her in it. So, oh, wait, do we maybe see... Do they maybe break into at least one house without her? Uh, maybe, maybe not. I'm not 100% sure. Anyway, so, yeah, you know, the ending, maybe it's just her paranoia, you know? I mean, okay, running out in front of a car is kind of weird, but weird things happen. That doesn't mean that there's a cult behind it, you know? And But to her, like, you see her face, she's convinced. She's certain that this is it. You know, and, and just, yeah. And, yeah, maybe she lives the rest of her life without ever meeting the cult again. You know, yeah, maybe the, maybe the cult is there and going to kill them all. Maybe she lives the rest of her life with ever, without ever meeting the cult again at all. Maybe it's some, you know, those are two extremes. Maybe it's something closer to the middle. I personally think it will take a very long amount of time, if it will ever happen at all, before she feels safe, before she doesn't feel a constant anxiety, and, yeah, and any longer, and that's what that kind of social environment can, can lead to, and it doesn't have to be a cult, it can be a school or an extremely negative family life. Now, let's see. Yeah, and near the end of the movie, the, you know, Martha has such a difficult time differentiating things that happened before, let's see, yeah, the past and the present. And she accidentally calls her sister, who she's now been with for several days, where she hasn't had any contact with the cult other than the phone call. She accidentally calls her Katie, the name of a cult member, because both of them told Martha that she shouldn't start eating before they're done cooking. You know, Lucy, when Lucy says that, it's basically an issue of manners. The cult member did it because it's part of the control of the members that Patrick demands the cult members inflict upon each other and considering that the cult members apparently only eat once a day it's no wonder she's hungry and despite her being awake when she runs away from what she thinks is I mean very likely Patrick I'm not sure we see anyone else we, we don't see anyone else rape her but yeah she can't completely tell the difference between Patrick and Ted and you know Considering her experiences, we can understand that, but at the same time, you can understand why Ted and Lucy don't want to accept her staying there. And it's, it, you know, she, she says, I don't feel safe with you here. I mean, what if, what if hypothetically Martha stayed there, Lucy became pregnant, and Martha kicked Lucy down the stairs. I mean, that she might lose the baby. You know, that's you can completely understand why the yeah. 
you know, personally, I do empathize more with Martha than anyone else in the movie, but I do understand why. Uh, yeah. Now, let's see the. But yeah, you know, when she, you know, the 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 cleansing they they call it, you know, she she drank uh, a lot of this, uh, you know. Um, yeah, I'm not sure we know exactly what it is made of, but some it's it's basically a fruit. You know, I I don't know. Is it technically a smoothie if you don't use a machine to make it? But yeah, you know, a fruit smoothie with some crushed. What was it? Half a crushed sleeping pill, you know, inside. And yeah, she passes out. And when she wakes up, he is already raping her. So, yeah, you know, for her, like she could w wake up at any point and be in the middle of being raped. And that's part of what Patrick does. You know, he wants them to always be afraid. You know, the the more afraid you are, the more weak you feel, the easier you are to control for someone who doesn't have enough empathy to feel bad about controlling people like that. So, I wanted to... Yes, so the, the cult appears to have some... You know, the, uh, Sean Durkin wanted to... He didn't want there to be too much political the political aspect of the cult he wanted to keep vague but I wanted to briefly talk about the the politics so the idea of living outside of a capitalist society and you know the the yeah growing your own food and and that whole thing that is a fairly left-leaning you know politically speaking aspect but the cult treat treats men as better than as being better than women. The men are allowed to eat first, and uh, you know, yeah, which is decidedly right wing. Also, seemingly Patrick has every female baby killed. He, you know, the, there's the quote: "He only has boys," and it's never specifically. We we're never told exactly, but yeah, I mean. I guess it's possible that it's just adoption, but then that, you know, that requires paperwork and that could lead back to the the farm and the cult. So, yeah, you know, and I don't, th you know, it seems it's so wild that this even has to be said out loud. Obviously, abortion is not murder. Late-term abortion is is obviously something that should be avoided, and it was made, it was outlawed under Roe v. Wade. The reason I say that Patrick has female babies killed is because if you don't go to a modern doctor with modern equipment, you can't tell before birth if it's a boy or a girl. That's something that we're used to because we have sonograms and all this, you know, but they, I, I would be extremely shocked if they actually went to, because, because, yeah, let's, yeah, I'm going to go out and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say within this piece of fiction, no, Patrick does not let these women see a proper doctor, you know, because then that, Doctor has to make a note. Okay, so uh, there's someone who's going to have a baby, and they live in this basic area, and Patrick doesn't want that. Patrick, you know, that's why they have to pretend to be either Marlene Willis or Michael, wait, Lewis. Yeah, Marlene Lewis or Marlene, ah, Michael Lewis. There we go. I got there eventually. Because he doesn't want anyone to know how many people are out on this farm, because if the police find out, oh, there's a bunch of people on the farm out there, and, you know, they hear about, oh, you know, this place was broken into, this place was broken into, and so on and so forth, you know, they might go talk to the people who live out on the farm, because that's not, you know, like, I'm, I'm obviously, 
There's plenty of people who live on a farm who don't steal, who aren't in cults or anything like that. But today, there's an expectation that you participate in society. You know, you, you it's very unusual these days to live on a farm and not have communication with the rest of the world, you know. And, yeah, you know, if it's, oh, it's just, I don't know, a couple, I guess, who, you know, Michael Lewis, Marlene Lewis live on the, you know, on this farm, I don't know, that, you know, that sounds fine. A, a couple living on a farm, that doesn't sound like a cult. But if you find out, you know, I don't know, I mean, I'd say there, it looks like there's at least a dozen people there. Sounds like a cult, you know, if, uh, again, unless it's a bunch of employees of the farm, you know, but yeah, let's see, so, so yeah, I, it is, it is my reading of the film that Patrick does not allow the women to go to a proper doctor you know, I'm, I can imagine at least one of the cult members probably has some, like, if, if the, if the people, if the, if the woman is healthy and the baby is healthy, you don't need a lot of modern medicine necessarily, if, if nothing goes wrong during the, the birth. And, yeah, you know, if he has, like, one or more, just a, a few cult members who are, who have a little bit of familiarity and, and a willingness to go and, and deal with, you know, be, be part of the birth, you know, at the end of the day, like, a lot of the stuff that, <laughs> I gotta be careful how I phrase things, I have nothing but respect for people who practice medicine today. I think if they keep practicing, eventually they'll be good. I I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it. But, you know, obviously there are huge issues with the medical industry. And, you know, yeah, it is definitely better to have a lot of people ready to take care of the birth in case it maybe goes wrong or something. You know, there's a lot of things that could go wrong. And if you don't have a doctor check on the pregnant lady during the the nine months, you don't even know what could go wrong. But yeah, you know, yeah, like, okay, so they probably, you know, Lamaze, you can, you know, yeah, that's that. Like today, let's see, twenty eleven. So they had some. Yeah, I can imagine that at least one of the cult members, once they were sufficiently loyal to Patrick, was allowed, you know, just go in and and like take a Lamaze class, uh, you know, or the or just talk to someone who could talk them through it, uh, you know, and. Yeah, so, so, and I, I also, I, th I think it's worth noting, when the sisters want to upset each other, Martha says, you're going to be a terrible mother, Lucy responds, you don't have any money left, do you? We'll make sure everything's paid for. Martha thinks the worst thing would be to be a bad parent, Lucy thinks the worst thing would be to have to be depend on other people, not be able to pay for things yourself. You know, the, the, cause, cause she easily could, like, if Lucy, th you know, yeah, Lucy could immediately, could easily respond, I'll be a better mother than you were a sister, or than you were a daughter, or something like that. Yeah. If, if they both wanted to, to target that, like, I could see Lucy responding, you're the reason, let, let's see, do we, we don't know, we know that their mother died, and apparently their father left, yeah, Lucy could easily say, you're the reason dad left, you know, that would really hurt Martha's feelings, but Lucy is so wrapped up in, 
material goods and all this it's, yeah and also th the cult members never accept Martha's pain they treat it as if there's something wrong with her for feeling it and which is another you know the um you know, if, if you're in a relationship, if, if one of your friends or your partner or something tells you that you shouldn't, you know, yeah, they straight up, like, they say that her feeling pain from the rape is a wonderful thing. The fact that she's forgotten some of it means that the cleansing, work, you know, all these things, if someone talks to you like that, get away from them that is incredibly unhealthy and Martha sleeps a lot note Lucy and Ted if she really does only eat once a day at the cult's farm her body might feel a greater need for rest Patrick controls and limits what they get to put in their bodies and to do with their bodies another measure of control you know he he keeps yeah, him keeping them hungry and for the smokers still wanting the nicotine fix of cigarettes, stuff like this means that they're more likely to do what he demands they do. They worry he'll take even that little bit of food away. And at first, Martha is not allowed to know what the late night drives are about, and later she joins them. After it goes fine by their standard, a number of times, one time it goes wrong. A cult member kills the person in the house can't stop thinking about it and it's what ultimately pushes her over the line why she flees and the other cult members talk about how death is a wonderful thing it makes you alert in a parallel universe she's still alive and the the patrick monologues you know that death is the most beautiful part of life right death is beautiful because we all fear death and fear is the most amazing emotion of all because it complete it creates complete awareness it brings you to now and makes it makes you truly present and when you're truly present that's nirvana that's pure love so death is pure love if you repeated these phrases back to the cult members right before they died an untimely death i'm willing to bet they would not be comforted by that and What's the other thing? Right, also the, the late night drives, you know, Max says he's never invited on, along to one of them. And then he gets a beer and asks if Martha wants one as well, because they won't be back for several hours. So the moment that they're gone, then they start, you know, they, they I mean... It's like like children when the teacher is away, you know, they're they're adults. They shouldn't have to sneak around like if you live around other people, like unless you're like like okay, if you get drunk and like break things or wake them up in the middle of the night or something, okay, you know, it makes sense for them to talk to you about you know, the drinking. But otherwise, it is none of their business. You know, they're of age. It's not yeah. Unless you ask for help to stop, they don't have, they shouldn't be telling you to stop as long as you can, yeah, control it. Immediately after meeting Martha, Patrick gives her a new name, a new identity. And that, you know, that's what she now has to use. And after raping her, he sings the song in front of everyone that further objectifies her. He's saying that while she's beautiful, it is her only worth. It is all she is, and he owns her. I realize some people have a more positive interpretation of that song. And I do appreciate it. It wasn't written for this movie. It's possible that the original, you know, maybe originally it meant some, if it... it yeah. Oh, wait, and actually, is there something about that he changes the lyrics a little? I feel like I read that he changes the lyrics a little bit to make it more objectifying. Now, 
but but yeah and we see he actually does that with all of the the people and you know he Martha becomes Marcy May Sarah becomes Sally I guess we don't even know Zoe's original name because by the time Martha meets her she's accepted that she's Zoe and and actually that's another thing you know they lose all privacy the, the there are you know really private details divulged in front of a lot of people like and and Martha's actually shocked that Patrick knows that her father left you know and and he's saying it right like in front of a bunch of people like this is not something you bring up in front of a lot of people as just yeah you know and again it's a way to control them they all like if they say like for example and, and we actually see we see that Martha's telling Zoe that she's uncomfortable with the guy that died that leads to you know she ends up locking herself in the bathroom to get some privacy to get some time and to get away from them always telling her that she should be okay with him dying and you know eventually like you know and Patrick wants to to go and manipulate her but he knows that if he says then she might not open the door so Zoe walks up and pretends to be alone and the moment that Martha unlocks the door Patrick goes in and starts manipulating her and Zoe just walks away you know because she's so sold on the idea you know and yeah the the you know sometimes he does push the push the cult members in private but a lot of the times he'll bring up their personal issues in front of everyone to make you know so that they don't feel like it, it makes them less likely to try to talk to a cult member you know because everyone knows everything anyway and it makes them feel weak it makes them feel like it's not their that they aren't entitled and obviously they are to work on their pain away from the public you know now in interview Elizabeth Olsen points out that after living with the cult Martha is no longer comfortable eating in front of a man At the same time as a man she takes tiny bites you know she's so used to getting too little to eat and in an interview Sean Durkin says the flashbacks are like Martha is experiencing the event depicted for the first time the director went back and forth on whether or not he should include the violence in the film that he does and he does think that it is worth noting that there are people who find some aspects of the cult appealing especially ones looking for family and belonging there's a scene where Martha is getting into Patrick's bed without him directly asking her to at the time she clearly wants intimacy and comfort but then he starts having sex with her against her will without even asking which is something that some men will do who are not in a cult a woman being close to a man without him forcing her to be doesn't mean that she has consented to sex you know I hope watching the scene would make some of the men who do this realize that it's not okay on giving consent it doesn't have to be verbally it can be in body language the woman can be the person to initiate but if you look at Martha's body language her face when she reacts to him starting to have sex with her clearly she had not given consent does not want to have sex with him at the time and if he legitimately believed that this is a situation where they will have sex why not just ask you know just in case ask her for her consent because he wants to be in control he wouldn't be able to accept her turning him down and let's see yeah when we see Watts catch up to Martha and try to convince her to come back to the cult she feels uncomfortable eating in front of him so he eats the rest of the food as a way of telling her that the men of the cult are still in control even if she can only see one of them if she's not currently in a place run by the cult or surrounded by cult members like when they bring in the houses and really realize she must have been starving because they eat so little and so rarely only once a day he even walks away conveying that he believes that he can literally leave her alone in a public place and she will still do what the cult wants and come back and 
I forget if I put anywhere else in my notes, so I'm gonna briefly get into it here. I've seen some people say that it doesn't make sense for Watts to leave. First of all, he legitimately thinks that she... Like, keep in mind, what would she have done if not call Lucy? Like, I don't think that any of the cult members believe that she could just call Lucy or, or Lucy or that Lucy would be, um, what's the word, would, would help her, you know, they don't usually contact their old family, she, you know, she herself says that to Sarah, and the, the, uh, what was the, let me think, there was something else that I wanted to say with that, yeah, you know, he, he thinks that she isn't going, she, basically he thinks you know, maybe it'll take an hour, maybe it'll even take two, but certainly before nighttime, she'll turn around, she'll walk back, maybe she'll even call us and ask us to come pick her up in the car if she doesn't want to walk all the way through the woods again, you know, so that's, that's one part of it. Another is, what exactly could he do? Like, if he, like, grabs her by the hand and tries to pull away from the table, that's going to get noticed. And even if he manages to get her away from there, at least one person is calling the cops. They're going to give an exact description of both people. They're going to tell them the address of the, the diner. And then the police come by. And, I mean... The idea that it's someone living in the woods would eventually come to their mind, you know, and they have to act if they think someone's being kidnapped, you know, and let's see, I suppose maybe he could ask the waitress, can you help my, uh, my, uh, cousin here is, is weak and she, she can't quite get to her feet, but we got to get her home. You know, she's going to look at Martha to, to like comprehend what. Is he telling us that that sounds kind of weird? She's gonna take one look at Martha's malnourished, you know, shivering, you know, scared out of her mind face, and she's gonna be like, "There's something going on here," you know, like the the um, yeah, it it really was the only thing he or yeah, you know. Let's say he, he goes to the, the phone, calls some more cult members to, to come by, and they all grab her and carry her out. He, these are all things that are going to get the cops to look into the farm. You know, this is... the, the It won't take the cops long to, to talk to the, the, you know, the people living the very closest to the, the, the place. And it probably won't take long for someone to to mention the black car, the uh, which is also like uh, is that an SUV? It's it's a specific kind of car, you know. So that also gets some, you know. And yeah, let's say that the police start looking for people who come from the the, the Catskills Mountains, and they are in in you know they drive in this black. SUV, you know, maybe they find the farm, or maybe they just, you know, yeah, like, whenever the, the, the cult break into someone's summer home, there's some chance that, I mean, all of these places have these big windows, what if someone sees them park the car, and then sees a bunch of people late at night walking towards the summer home, and the police came by, you know, a month earlier and told them, if you see an SUV or a man fitting this description or a woman fitting this description, call us. We want to talk to them. Yeah, you know, that's... So, so he really has no other choice. Now, let's see. The, um... All right. Yeah, so, very brief spoiler for, yeah, until you see me lower my index finger, I will be spoiling A Beautiful Mind. So if you don't 
if you haven't watched that movie already, and I, you definitely shouldn't get it, have it spoiled. You should watch it. Skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. That movie does an excellent job getting the audience to empathize with someone who hallucinates. This movie does a great job getting people to empathize with someone who has PTSD. It doesn't work for everybody. There are people who reviewed this movie and didn't seem to... Uh, didn't like that the flashback editing was supposed to challenge the audience to view the world the way Martha does. No more spoilers for A Beautiful Mind. It is not wrong to make movies that are about trauma that a number of women, women experience. It is wrong to use it only as a reason for a man to seek revenge and or only to establish a certain character or group as evil. It is right to use in fiction if you explore the trauma she's endured, the effect it had on her, and this movie is devoted to exploring those. That's its strength. That's why some reviews basically blame Martha or say her behavior is disproportionate to the trauma because a lot of people are uncomfortable engaging with women's trauma. There's a cultural issue. It's very frequently dismissed with, well, revenge will take care of it. She made one or more mistakes, so it will only happen to those who make those mistakes. This movie won't let you off the hook that easily. That's part of why a lot of people hate the ending of the movie. They expected that it would resolve it as if it is that easy in real life. Yeah, let's see. And that's actually, you know, we we see what Martha is wearing and how she's carrying herself around Patrick when they first meet, and nothing in it suggests that she is like, you know, ah, what's the word? That that she's going to be you know, sexually giving in to anything he wants. You know, she she's dressed perfectly normally, and yeah, she, she talks to him normally also, you know. There are relationships where, you know, one or more people involved, and it's not only women either, will, like carry themselves in a way that tell the other person I want to have sex with you uh, you know but that's not what we see here it's it's clear like she talks to Patrick like she thinks that he owns an apartment that she's going to move into or or maybe like a, a school teacher or something but she does not talk to him in, you know, the way she talks to him is not the way you would talk to someone to to convince, to, to convey to them, you know, I want to have sex with you. And when, when Martha says to Lucy, just because we're sisters doesn't mean we have to talk about everything that comes into your head. Martha is fighting against getting psychological help, something that a lot of people do when in therapy because the lizard brain feels threatened since it only perceives the pain and stress the therapy can cause. It doesn't understand that the other, that on the other side of it, you're better off. Let's see. Yeah, so the, yeah, the cult controls food, clothes, where the members are, what they do, who they're in contact with. So the members can't get help and are more likely to accept the extreme things Patrick wants from them. He still needs to be gradual in introducing the extreme things. If right after he renamed Martha to Marcy May, he told her he'd rape her whenever he wants and get her to participate in numerous burglaries to the point where eventually they get caught red-handed one of and, and yeah, a cult member kills the, the homeowner, she turn around and run away, few other options or not. But it is so gradual, and over time, so many things she used to know were unacceptable are now second nature. She doesn't even immediately run from the cult after the killing. First, she tries talking to Zoe, ex expecting that she too will realize how wrong the killing is. And in Zoe's defense, she does later leave. You know, I, I think it might be... There, there might not even have happened anything in between. She might just have realized that she could leave because Martha did, and sometimes that is enough. And you frequently see 
when when someone is accused of rape and has done it before, a lot of the women who will come forward saying that they too were raped, they will, you know, they'll they'll say they felt like they couldn't come forward if you know if they when they thought that they were the only one, they just couldn't. Yeah. Let's see. So the. I don't want too much of any one of these videos to just be me responding to criticism I disagree with over the course of this video. I've tried to make my case for what I think is great about the movie. Some of it was partially responding to criticism. Now that I'm in the spoiler section, I want to briefly respond to some of the ones that require going to spoilers. I strongly disagree that the sex and nudity are there for titillation. They are there to show the effect of the cult. Sex and nudity are normal parts of adult life, but the use in this movie is supposed to be shocking, not in the avert your eyes kind of way. We see that Martha no longer understands the inhibitions of society. It is perfectly alright to not like this movie, even to hate it. I'm not saying anybody is wrong for that, but I must admit I find it disturbing how many people like just announced to the world that they couldn't sympathize be with Martha because of her behavior and because the movie doesn't give a lot of concrete details on why she joined the cult and some people didn't feel that the movie made it clear why she left I do not understand how you can watch this entire movie and be confused as to why she left the cult but to each their own. If you're still not sure, it's because she saw someone she trusted, Katie, murder someone in cold blood, and then everyone in the cult act like she's unreasonable for being upset about that. The reason to empathize with her is that she's a human being, and we spend a lot of time in her head, in her memories, and we're shown how her perception of a lot of things have been warped by the cult. Not every character in every movie is easy to empathize with, and certainly the ones that don't get a lot of screen time or we don't get to know very much about, it is a real uphill battle. The more we find out about Martha, the more clear it becomes that she needs help. And thankfully, some people did put in their review that that was their conclusion as well. And... Now, the... the I, oh, I feel like there was one more thing I wanted to say. Otherwise, I guess... It ends. Yeah, I'm gonna. Uh, I swear I'm not gonna spend forever trying to remember. Let's see. There was. I, I wanted to go into that. The. Maybe I did get into everything. Okay, so. Hit me up in the comments. Let me know what is your favorite movie like this. Do you think that anything in this movie should have been different? I promise you I will hear you out. And uh, let's see. Yeah, I think that is about... Yeah, if you know, if you want to recommend a movie that's similar to this, I definitely, you know, put it in the comments. If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. One, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about my spoiler for thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show, which these days is She-Hulk. Let's see. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one, but with the thoughts in this... Uh, in other words, if you want more videos like this, you're luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoy watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. And I keep going back and forth on whether or not I'm going to...
say this joke. So I'm going to put it here at the end. So if you don't want to hear a joke about this movie, then just end the video now. But yeah, so I'm not going to put my finger up because I'm ending the video right after this. So spoilers for the MCU and maybe also the movie Glass, the, the, uh, yeah, the sequel to Split. Sometimes I like to pretend it's my head canon that Elizabeth Olsen is playing Wanda Maximoff, Sarah Paulson is playing her character in Glass, and she's just trying to figure out if Wanda really does believe that she now has superpowers because of the trauma she's endured. I know, terrible joke. I, I was about to say I warned you, but I guess I didn't warn you. I just said it was going to be a joke about the movie. Anyway, with that terrible thing uttered, catch you next week.